Good morning and welcome to Study IQ. I am Prashant Mavani. I hope you all are doing good, my dear friends. Today is 21st January 2020. Day is Tuesday and on our table we have many interesting articles. The first one that we are going to discuss today is Guaranteeing Healthcare the Brazilian Way. A very interesting article. It is about universal health coverage in Brazil and there are so many things that India can learn from Brazil. Brazil remember yesterday we were talking about NHS of UK and i explained to you guys how it works or the contribution basically but here uh, brazil has achieved something that is outstanding and there are so many things that we can learn from brazil but before that can i quickly introduce all of you to our pen drive and tablet courses which are designed by the best faculties of our nation You know that with the help of our pen drive and tablet courses there are thousands of students out there they have cracked various different competitive exams you too can do the same thing by purchasing it from studyiq.com if you have any question queries doubts regarding it give us a call on the numbers that you can see on your screen to download the pdf of today's lecture do visit my fb page please make sure that you too share this lecture with other students and don't forget to hit the like button and please 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 do subscribe to our YouTube channel. So on your screen you have a picture or a photo of Brazilian president. His name is Jair Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro is going to be our official guest. He is going to be in New Delhi on this Republic Day. We are going to talk about healthcare system of Brazil, but before that, I would like you guys, uh, you know, I would like to take you guys on a geographical or a map tour. Let's understand this country. in brazil uh, geographically speaking uh, right to this country is a very important as well as one of the most uh, you can say dominant country in uh, south america uh, as far as area is concerned it is the biggest country right uh, you can see on your screen that uh, it is uh, sharing its border with uh, various different uh, countries uh, starting anti clockwise from 12 o'clock we have french guiana then you have suriname Uh, Guyana, Venezuela, uh, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, uh, Paraguay and uh, a small border with Argentina and then you have Uruguay. I think uh, it's uh, only one or two countries are left apart from that uh, most of the South uh, African countries are sharing its border with uh, this nation called Brazil. Capital is uh, Brasilia, Rio de Janeiro is a very famous place or a city. and then you have two important geor- geographical lines passing through it i'm talking about uh, latitudes 0 uh, degree that is equator and as you can see here tropic of cancer both these lines are passing from this country so a very big chunk of brazil is in tropical region and what do we know about tropical region a tropical region will have uh, you know sunlight it will have big plants what you have studied in your ncerts or your basic books of geography that you find biodiversity in tropical region right flora and fauna and all other living organisms as well so naturally you are going to encounter more mosquitoes you are going to encounter more insects the variety is going to be quite wide and uh, brazil is also famous for amazon river as well as forest so challenges when it comes to let's say infectious diseases right uh, they are going to be a bit more severe when we compare ourselves with brazil or our country with brazil and achieving healthcare in this country a country that is this diverse not just in terms of environment in terms of just like india brazil also has many states right So the things that uh, Brazil has achieved uh, and if, when we understand the geography of this country then we realize that it's it's something remarkable what they have achieved. So now let's see what they have achieved. As far as uh, healthcare system is concerned there are so many things that we can learn from Brazil. The first thing is that for a developing country to achieve universal health coverage itself is a very challenging thing. A developing country has so many things to do. at the same time like you have to look after your infrastructure you have to uh, invest in education you have to work on your science and technology research and other things and then you have some issues natural disasters climate change 
uh, supporting farmers, supporting manufacturing industry and so many things. I hope you can understand what I'm trying to say. So it's very difficult for a developing country, you know, to, to achieve this thing because you have limited resources, limited time. And um, on top, you are a tropical country. So it becomes a bit more challenging. Now, Brazil is the only country where more than 100 million inhabitants have a universal health system. Yesterday, we were talking about NHS. NHS is good system, but uh, as far as quantity and reach is concerned, right, the Brazilian system is far better. And unified health system was written into the new constitution of Brazil back in 1988. So there are so many things that we can learn. Like recently, India has also launched this Ayushman Bharat or Pradhan Madri Jan Arogya Yojana, PMJAY. And there are many things that we can learn from Brazil as far as like primary health centers are concerned. Um, no, we are going to develop this primary health uh, care centers in, in, in the remote part of our or at grassroots level. So th these are the things that we can learn from Brazil. Now, uh, since 1988, uh, in last 30 years, uh, life expectancy has increased from 64 years to almost 76 years. I'm talking about Brazil here, right? This are Brazil's figure. Infant mortality rate, it used to be 53 uh, per 1,000 life birth, but now it is 14 only. Polio vaccination has reached 98% of the population. 2015 report says that 95% of those uh, that seek care in the SUS are able to receive proper treatment as well. NHS, uh, for NHS, for maintaining and running NHS, uh, Britain spends 7.5% uh, of its GDP while Brazilian program is far bigger than as well, Brazil spends just a 3.8% of its GDP. Mind you that uh, GDP of uh, Britain is bigger and economy as well is bigger than Brazil. But then as well, Brazil is spending only a tiny amount when we compare it with Britain. But it's doing quite well. Brazil will need to increase uh, its, uh, you know, uh, percentage point of GDP. Like it has to increase 1.6%. It has to add. So roughly, let's say 5% of its GDP by 2060 because of a fast aging society and same thing will happen with our country as well. At present our nation is a very young nation but in future all our youngsters they will reach 60s, 70s in when we will be in that age bracket. Our health necessity will be totally different. At present our health necessity is quite less I would say because we are you know maximum population is majority is young. So reasonably or generally younger people are more fit but when you have a nation where you have majority of people who are above 60 then your health challenges and your facilities or the needs will increase as well so we have to prepare ourselves for next uh, we have to start from today itself if we want to achieve something after 30 years now uh, achieving universal coverage in india with a population of 1.3 billion is a challenge of epic proportions as we can understand because of limited resources and other things at present we are spending what 1.3 percent of our gdp or rather i would say it's not an expenditure it is an investment uh, you can call it expenditure because uh, most of the things that we are doing are reactive right there is a big difference uh, in how uh, things are going on in different countries like in Japan, in, in Brazil as well. Brazil has this family health program. Now, how it works, uh, you have community-based healthcare network. Now, this agents, health agents will visit uh, family members every month. Uh, they will be at your home and they will, you know, go through your uh, each and every individual, what you are eating, what are your habits, right? What are the things that you should avoid uh, they will create awareness and all these things. So these are all preventive as well as I would say proactive measures. Uh, something similar has been practiced by Japan for a very long period of time. Uh, doctors in Japan, the government doctors, right? Uh, one of the doctor from India, I was discussing things uh, with one of my friend who is a doctor. So uh, he told me that uh, uh, he has visited Japan many times. I know so he was telling me that in Japan how it works is that uh, government doctors or public doctors they have to visit, visit each and every household and the team basically is given an area and your salary will be based on 
on uh, the number of people uh, staying healthy so let's say if you are looking after 1000 families and if none of them report illness or anything in a month then you will get your full salary or else uh, depending on how many people are ill or how many family members or families are ill based on that uh, your your salary will be so incentive is you know to to earn maximum you have to provide a proactive support so it's a very interesting way of uh, you know of of looking after your uh, people or public health so something similar has been practiced by uh, this brazil as well this visit of community health agents and things so they are basically promoting health and preventive preventing these uh, diseases and uh, 4% of coverage in uh, 2000 there was a time when this health family health program used to cover only 4% but at present it has covered 64 back in like latest data says that it has covered 64% as far as our country is concerned we are a very diverse country we have uh, different challenges for uh, tamil nadu uh, sikkim bihar etc Uh, but uh, the things that we can learn from brazil is that brazil is also a country that uh, that has uh, its own you know unique diversity i'm not just talking about uh, ecological bio, uh, diversity it's also about various different states uh, they have their different way of life and different foods and other things so what we need is in our country we need a combination of uh, standardized programs as well as autonomy few things can be pan india right like let's say polio drops now there's nothing you can change with polio drops you know they 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 are as it is so this is something you know it should be available standardized but few regions are affected by uh, japanese fever or this uh, other things like sickle cell issues are prevalent in a uh, few tribal groups so for that we need autonomy so states should follow uh, there should be a you know balance of uh, standardization as well as uh, autonomy moreover regional disparities are also something that we have to take on board like uh, s- northeastern states uh, they don't have that many resources as far as money and infrastructure is concerned and other states uh, they are quite developed so uh, different states will require different uh, support some of them would require extra hand holding so we have to prepare ourselves for that as well and these are the things that we have to do so basically the bottom line is when we have this jair balsonaro in our country there are other things on which we are going to of course work like trade and investment research and development defense and so many other things climate change at the same time healthcare is something that uh, you know we can learn from brazil and we should uh, take an initiative and develop a very strong uh, relationship with brazil when it comes to healthcare services because the challenges that we are facing today brazil used to face it few years or few decades ago and it has achieved it so we too can do the same then we have a small editorial easy to understand one it's on a tragic uh, track it's about uh, a lady uh, remember it was a news item a 40 year old lady she was out in jungle with her husband and few friends they were out on an adventure trip but unfortunately Uh, there was an encounter with an elephant and this elephant has killed this lady so this is not uh, uh, you can say one off or just a single incident we find this sort of things many a times uh, in various different newspapers in various different parts of our country so venturing into forest for a trek without certified guides is akin to walking into a death trap of course we find so many cases not just Uh, human co- uh, human wild animal conflict but other incidents like uh, someone falling off cliffs and other sort of incidents and one of the main reason is ignorance of laws uh, governing forestry what we need is we need a robust uh, forest guard system uh, we should have this uh, you know uh, technology and uh, forest people as well this guards i'm talking about forest department they should de- deploy this technology through which they can particularly those vulnerable Uh, porous areas from where uh, these people are entering illegally entering uh, this forest area they should be they should be stopped and uh, they should be you know there there should be awareness drive as well that people should not enter forest area because it destroys a uh, human animal relationship you know uh, we don't have that much time to discuss all these things but means uh, i'll give you a quick example you know like lions or any other tiger or any other this sort of uh, 
feline animals. There are so many pockets where, uh, like in Africa, where lions have never encountered or they have never seen human beings. So in those areas, just imagine if a few people will just go there out for adventure. Now, that will create a first impression on lions about humans. And um, if, if, if it is going to be a negative experience for lions, then the same thing will be, you know, basically they will teach the same negative thing about human beings to their kids or their cubs and the same thing will go on and on and then the whole relationship between that lions and human beings uh, will be all together in a different zone so many a times you know those people who are who are not pro or who are not professionals they should avoid this sort of things then what uh, states uh, should do, states should promote ecotourism. States should create this capacity where people who are, who are you know, enthusiastic about adventures and other things, then state government should provide official facilities so that people can go there in best safety as well as they can get the thrill as well uh, under the supervision of a forest department. Atulia Mishra Committee has said that government should deploy this uh, high-tech uh, Aerial vehicles, basically drones. I would also say that uh, based on the experience of Virunga National Park, uh, you know, this Democratic Republic of Congo, this uh, forest department has a good experience in this Virunga National Park. They are basically conserving these uh, uh, gorillas uh, in this in this part. Uh, it's in Congo. It's a very famous, uh, this Virunga National Park is famous for these gorillas. So what they have done is uh, they have used technologies and other things, drones, but at the same time they are using bloodhounds. Bloodhound is a breed of dog. Let me write it down here, bloodhound. And this bloodhound is number one when it comes to, to smell, you know, so it can sniff things very well. It's best dog as far as the sniffing is concerned. So this dog is deployed and you won't believe the capability of this dog. Uh, it's a very, you can say, tropical forest then as well. It can pinpoint even if a poacher has entered, right? And if you let this dog loose, then this dog will take you to that poacher. So we can do the same thing. Like all those places where illegal trackers are entering or poachers are entering, we can stop them using drones as well as bloodhounds and this sort of techniques. Moving on to next item, dear friends, we have two articles on Russia. This one is on Russia and this one is on Russia as well. So I have clubbed both of them together one by one. We'll start with this one, then we'll go through this one. But before we jump on to this article on Russia and the things that are going on in Russia, let me tell you that I have dropped this article here and this article. This two we are not discussing. Instead, we are going to discuss one TOI, that is Times of India editorial. I have one Times of India editorial on Kashmir. Uh, on board this too, or one is about CA, other one is about Delhi police. It's talking about the same protest and same thing. So no point of repeating the same thing again and again. If you have extra time, you can have a quick glance or you can quickly skim him. If you don't have time, then you can drop them. It's fine. It's nothing that you will lose from if you, if you don't follow these two articles, right? Because uh, already we have talked about this sort of things. And um, Amit Saini uh, has also talked about this sort of topics many a times with you guys. So, right. So let's uh, crack on with this uh, article on Russia. On your screen, you can see Vladimir Putin. He is the president of Russia, a very powerful leader, quite famous in the world as well. And he is in news uh, from last uh, one week because uh, Vladimir Putin has made some major announcements. He has made some major changes or announced about major changes. Uh, they are predominantly in three directions. The first one is constitutional change. Uh, reshuffling his close aides and policymakers and a slew of economic and social measures. I have this 10 points. Uh, you can go through them, all of them, uh, once you download the PDF. I am going to take you through most important things, right? Uh, we are not going into all these 10 points and not all 10 are important from from your examination point of view, right? Uh, if you are preparing for Russian civil services, then yes, it would be important. But for you guys, it's just important to understand what are the things that are going to change in Russia in future. 
So last week uh, he made some big announcements and uh, basically Mr. Putin has proposed that Russian legislature, that is Duma, that is the lower house or Lok Sabha, will actually get more powers now. For example, this Duma or Lok Sabha of Russia will now approve the appointment of Prime Minister and the President's uh, deputies and Cabinet Ministers. Earlier on, in original constitution, it was the President who used to do all these things. But now the Duma will have the power to endorse or reject the President's choice. Remember, Mr. Putin is going to be the President till 2024. Right? He's there as a President 2024. So all things will take place after. You know, after 2024, these things will change. The president retains the right to suggest the names and dismiss them. To suggest a name, president can do it and dismiss uh, these people. Again, president can do it. The state council, is, it's a basically a new, it's an assembly of governors of uh, these federal states or these uh, various different states or provinces of Russia. So earlier on it used to be just a consultative body, but now it's going to get constitutional uh, status. Uh, Mr. Putin continues to hold Full control, of course, uh, right? Uh, this parliament, uh, this uh, prime minister, as well as uh, ba ba basically, this is prime minister. He is the. He used to be the prime. He was prime minister. Uh, his name is uh, Dmitry Medvedev. Uh, he's a very close friend, or I would say, aide of uh, Mr. Putin. Mm, he has been with Putin for I think more than twenty years now. So Mr. Putin also addressed the major internal security threats as well. There are challenges in front of uh, Russia, right? Uh, Russia is uh, facing this big challenge of low birth rate as well as high mort mortality, which Putin said is unacceptable. He also said that all those uh, families or children, uh, um, you know, having low income, they belong. Uh, all those children from low income families, they will be given. These families will be given monthly cash handouts. Uh, children till age of uh, till till grade four in Russian schools will get free lunch, so it's going to be support for family, and mothers uh, after their first and second child will get benefits and uh, payments. Public spending and infrastructure projects will get a boost, particularly to get rid of poverty, social tensions, uh, reduce these income gaps, and improve health. And per year, Russia will be spending $7.5 billion uh, for achieving all these socio and economical targets. Uh, he talked about uh, other things as well, right? Uh, he, uh, Mr. Putin uh, is going to retain control, as I told you, right, till 2024. And basically, there are, there are experts who are saying that uh, uh, the, the things that he has changed or, or the changes that he has announced uh, at present, it's basically about keeping power after 2024. Putin is somewhere 67 years old. So I think, right, after four years, when he will be 71, 72, uh, he will step down, but uh, he will not be out of politics. He will uh, stay at a very, you can say, a strategic position from where he can control and if required he can step in but uh, i think he is trying to create institutions uh, so uh, after putin you may have some other leader but he's creating institutions so that in future you know russia can achieve when putin is not there or, or the people who are going to come after even if they are not there this country as an organization as a big machine can 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 progress towards its long term vision and he also talked about external challenges like uh, usa then basically nato and other western world they are like number one enemy of russia and for uh, all these countries uh, russia is also a big military threat uh, mr putin has personally weaved uh, relations uh, with various different countries like india china etc so he is a very popular leader uh, and he is serving his fourth term this is this editorial stay put uh, a 2008 maneuver took place uh, where Dmitry Medvedev was made prime uh, from prime minister. He was made president, and uh, Mr. Putin became uh, prime minister. Actual power de facto power was with Putin, or has always been with Putin from last uh, what uh, 10 years, I think. Yes, somewhere around. No, no, beg your pardon, not 10, 20 years. Somewhere around more than 20 years he has been. So he's already finished his two terms. Then he became prime minister for five years. Four years, I guess. It was four years. And then back in 2013, he came back. 
uh, as a president. Uh, so this time, this term was extended to six years and he's going to th be there until 2024. Mr. Putin also pointed to, uh, he also said that uh, there is a possibility that in future a woman uh, could be pr president, uh, president or prime minister of this country called Russia. Mr. Putin is uh, someone who is uh, not a firm believer or basically he rejects uh, liberalism. He says that liberalism is not going to solve today's uh, problems and uh, he believes there should be a proper central government with full powers. If you if you run after liberty, as per this Mr. Putin, if you say that, basically I'm explaining how it works in Russia. So, development, social structure, everything, socio-economic development will be looked after by the government, but you are not allowed to do so many things. The rights that we enjoy here, you don't enjoy the same rights over there. Uh, but uh, the thing government focuses at present is, the main focus in this sort of system is that government will achieve you know when you have this central power you can have uh, you know decisions will be implemented as well as taken at a, at a at a central point you have one on top of pyramid will decide everything so decisions taken by here from here will be you know passed on to all these different parts of pyramid so it becomes a bit easier to control uh, a country like this uh, compared to a country like india where you have uh, decisions you know they are they are all democratic decisions so it becomes difficult for achieving that growth or the speed of that growth i would say pace uh, decreases because of various different challenges so that's basically everything about uh, this two articles we are done with this two and everything right uh, now let me take you through this one this is about redesigning india's uh, ailing data system we're going to be a bit quick here it's easy to understand you see if you go through this article you will find some techn technical terms as well it would be much useful for you if you are preparing for masters in statistics but for your general studies right uh, basic things that we are going to pick from this article is more than enough now gross domestic product uh, base year 2011 12 it was sh shifted and uh, you know then we saw this uh, controversy of employment unemployment uh, data was withheld by government and consumer expenditure data was not released and it created this uh, you know discussion or there was this controversy like like there are so many experts and analysts who are saying that we cannot rely on government's data because government this government of india has done so many changes and these changes are some of them are quite negative that's what experts say like national sample survey office uh, now comes under the fold of national statistics office earlier on it used to be looked after by governing council and national statistical commission but uh, now it will be looked after by this national statistics office uh, so all these changes uh, have created a sort of suspicion on government's data which is not good at all because just like any other thing, uh, statistics are also, uh, official statistics are like a public good. And based on this uh, data, uh, people will take a decision. The, your market's behavior will be decided by by the data. If the data is good, right, then, then people will take positive decisions. If they find that investment climate is has improved, if more and more companies are investing in all these things, then more investors will become enthusiastic about uh, investing in our country. Uh, same thing goes with uh, employment rate, unemployment. If unemployment rate is getting higher and higher, then people can take decision whether this government is performing well or not. And this applies to so many different things. So basically, as we know that data is considered as 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 oil, it is as important as uh, uh, fuel or fossil fuel uh, in the same way you know data helps us uh, data is a sort of brick through which we can build our palace you can say and uh, without data we don't uh, we cannot have knowledge about what's going on simple as that replacing annual survey of industries asi with ministry of corporate affairs uh, mca 21 is uh, has also posed a serious data and methodological issues methods applied under this mca 21 is quite different from what it used to be in AS asi and this has also created a sort of suspicion now this article is arguing that uh, we should collect and collect data using more modern technology for example israel is israel will collect data of uh, production of wheat grain uh, other things at the same time it will also collect data on 
uh, soil, moisture, uh, and other things, uh, so that we can take a bit more proper decisions, and this will help us design our policy, and something that we need in our country as well, using all this industrial revolution, biotechnology, robotics, etc., and how they impact uh, various different sectors all this data is important for us and only then we can once we have proper data once we analyze the data that we have then only we can design proper strategy and policies for future so we need this sort of uh, system our system so far has been good we have talented people as well working for our statistical department uh, we need to give them freedom uh, you know there should not be any fear or interference uh, from from government of course government can do a supervisory role but data should be presented as it is and data is as i told you a new oil right modern world and future world is is going to work on data only and this is the main reason why you find so many these companies like facebook instagram and uh, there are so many other products and companies and services they are providing all these things for free because what they are doing is they are collecting our data they are they are observing how we behave and based on this behavior they are creating our personality profile and based on this profile uh, they are uh, they are advertising things and they are producing uh, products and services based on our habits and other things you know so this is the level uh, where other companies are thinking and all these things are possible because they know how to use data they know they know the access or they have this access as well as they have uh, this ability you know to digest and analyze data last article it's about to dream of home it's an article from times of india editorial from times of india so this one is talking about 30th anniversary of kashmiri pandit's uh, tragic displacement at present uh, there is a thing that is uh, you know trending online and that is uh, this is hashtag is uh, hashtag hum wapas aayenge we will we will return so it's about as sort of affirmation from Kashmiri Pandit that we will return to our home that is Kashmir. Now, for what the valley needs today is a is a return to normalcy and uh, prosperity, and this can be achieved only when two communities, Muslims and Kashmiri Pandits, right, they shake hand with each other, and all the valley that we find, or the distance uh, that has occurred because of this uh, this uh, horrific incident that took place about thirty years thirty years ago. Uh, has to be sorted out by today's generation you know together they have to forgive and forget and they have to promise that uh, they are going to work for each other for the nation and you know for the safety and betterment of the society of kashmir uh, what we have also observed is that after this uh, you know this nullification of article 370 we saw that uh, tourism industry apple trade service sector everything has uh, come to a choke hold and uh, to to rejuvenate it we have to first of all create a peaceful environment once we have achieved a peaceful environment we need uh, political parties uh, political leaders to come out and guide and uh, you know navigate uh, the society of uh, jammu and kashmir uh, to a new height we can achieve so many things and mr amit sa the home minister officially said that uh, give us 5 years and we will make kashmir the most developed state in india now uh, it's going to be challenging it's not that easy but if he is confident then let's hope uh, that uh, kashmir becomes one of the most developed state in india because uh, for a very long period of time people of kashmir they have suffered right uh, those who those who have left kashmir like kashmiri pandits as well as there are so many people out there who are living there they have also suffered because it is said and this is true as well that only a small chunk of population is maybe 5% are are you know they want this independence and they are talking about pakistan and friendship with or relationship with pakistan most of them are are with our country because they are indians isn't it and uh, see the news item jammu and kashmir lieutenant governor has invited investors and he has said that only 10% of the area is affected by militancy and law and order and things uh, will be sorted out in near future three hizbul militants were killed in sofian encounter by our military forces a supreme court declines to stay paul bond scheme uh, 19 convicted in muzaffar shelter home case bridges thakur case and uh, on 28th and uh, 28 january a quantum of a sentence uh, arguments on quantum of a sentence will be heard uh, Tanjavur gets uh, Sukhoi squadron 
uh, government to, to take uh, clearance uh, or environmental clearance uh, regarding this water aerodrome for seaplanes. Uh, Iran says it may pull out of NPT. Park urges US to get it off uh, this FATF grey list. And uh, the picture here is about virus outbreak uh, in Beijing and Shanghai. And that's everything in today's uh, discussion, dear friends. Thank you very much for watching this video. Do share this lecture with other students. And I will see you all soon with daily financial news analysis. Till then, enjoy your studies. God bless you all. Jai Hind.